Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, church. Hallelujah. We just want to thank God for another day, another evening, where we can come together as a family, as a body of Christ, to just worship God, to just come before his throne. And we just want to take this moment now to, to just worship and just to exalt his name, give him all the glory, all the praise that is due unto him. I think in this period we've got so many reasons to just thank God for what he has done for us. You know, if we were to start to count our blessings, there's too many to count. And we just want to use this opportunity to praise him because that's what we can give to him and that's what he loves. And right now I want you to stand up wherever you are, in your homes, your bedrooms, your kitchens, maybe you're even on the road, on the train. And I just want you to come and just bow yourselves before God, bow your hearts and just come before him, start to worship him, just say, God, as we start this service today, come and speak to me, come and minister to me. I'm coming with an open heart. If there's any sin within us, that God will cleanse us. He will purify us. We want our worship to be acceptable to him. We want our worship to be a sweet smelling savor unto him. And dear Lord, we just want to thank you. Thank you because you are good. You are kind. You are faithful. You are loving. You love us much, much more than we deserve. And right now, as we are about to sing, as we are about to worship, let it be acceptable unto you. Come and take your rightful place. Be in the midst of us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. He's mercy.
Ancient of days As old as you are As old as you are You will never change Ancient of days As old as you are As old as you are You will never change You will never change Ancient of days Because he lives, oh, fear is gone. Because I know he holds my future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Because he lives. Because he lives. Oh, I can face tomorrow. Be
to give up, I be a fool. You are my all in all. You are my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all. Chapter 4 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, specially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. I pray it will be an enriching time for every one of us. 
Are you here that amen? Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for all your children, members, ministers who are here tonight. And in all the various districts and groups and everywhere online and all the states and all the regions, everywhere we're hearing the word together in Africa and beyond. We're asking, Lord, tonight you open the eyes of everyone to behold wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. Enlighten us, Lord. And we pray it will not be studied just for the head. It will be for the heart of everyone in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, the grace to abide in the world, the strength to be obedient to the world. You grant to everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Keep us awake and help us, Lord, to receive everything you are sending to every one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the people of God said, As you know, we are studying the epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Tonight, we're looking at verses 9 all through to 23. Look at verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. For we are laborers together with God. Paul the Apostle has been speaking about himself, the Apostle, and then Apollos, who was watering what he had already planted. And he wanted the Corinthian believers to understand that Paul, the planter, Apollos, the waterer, that they were labor laboring together with God, that there shouldn't be any division, any disunity, any disaffection between Paul and Apollos. But the Corinthian believers have not there, they have not understood very well. And that's why they were carnal in their understanding. They were carnal in their expression. They were carnal in their affection. They were carnal in their response to the word of the Lord. That's why they said, this one said, I'm of Paul. Another one said, I'm of Apollos. Another one said, I'm of Severs. That means I'm of Peter. Other people said, I don't even recognize any human leader. I am of Christ. And then Paul the Apostle asked them, is Christ divided? Is the Savior divided? Is our Lord divided? Is the Son of God who sent us to you and gave us different ministries, some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers, this same Christ and this same Lord who has given all these ministers and all these shepherds and pastors to us, is that Christ divided and he wanted to bring them back together so that they will have the real understanding that whether the word of salvation is coming from Paul or the word of uh, strengthening uh, is coming from Apollos, everything is still one because all scripture is given to us by the inspiration of God. And everything coming from Paul, coming from Apollos, coming from uh, Severus, coming from the apostle, coming from the prophet, coming from the evangelist, coming from the pastor, coming from the teacher, everything is profit profitable, profitable unto doctrine, and profitable unto rebuke, and profitable unto instruction, profitable unto correction, so that God will use all those ministers to bring God to perfection, and will become truly furnished unto every good work. And that's why he emphasizes now, and he says, for we 
all the preachers for we, all the ministers we, all the pastors, we are laborers together with God. One, we're laboring with God. One, two, we're laboring with one another. And we have one purpose, we recognize one thing, that ye are God's husbandry and ye are God's building. And then he tells us in verse 10, in verse 10 he says, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. You know what he's emphasizing? Somebody lays the foundation. An apostle lays the foundation, and then another person, a pastor, a teacher, may come after that, and then he builds thereon. He says, let every man that take heed, let that he buildeth thereon. Let everyone, everyone that comes later as a pastor, later as a teacher, or later as a counselor, or later as a helper, let everyone take heed how he buildeth thereon. That's why we're looking at the word tonight, building together with God in view of eternity. The apostle is building and is building with God and he has eternity in view, and he has never dying souls in view, he has the sinners in view, he has the saints in view, and he ministers while looking at their destiny and looking at their calling in the light of eternity. A teacher comes along after that, a helper comes along after that, a supportive minister, a supportive ministry comes after that and is building on the foundation that the apostle has laid and he does that in the light of eternity. He's talking about all of us as members, as ministers, is talking about the preacher and the people of God, is talking about everyone that contributes anything to the building and to the growing and to the edifying of the body of Christ that we understand we ought to build with God and we understand we ought to build with eternity in view. Tonight, building together with God in view of eternity. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, the foundation received by wise master builder. The foundation received by the wise master builder. There is a builder, but then there ought to be an architect. There ought to be someone who has made the construction was given the principle, was given all the precepts that we ought to follow. And then a builder comes along, he wants to build the kingdom. He wants to build the church. He wants to build every family. He wants to build every individual that comes into the kingdom of God and he looks at the pattern. He looks at what the Lord has laid down. And as a wise builder, a wise master builder, he follows the pattern and he lays the foundation and then he builds on the foundation. Point number one, the foundation received by the wise master builder. Point number two, the fire to reveal the worthy or worthless ministry. Everything we do is a ministry. Those of us who support, those of us who teach, those of us who counsel, those of us who lead other people, it's all ministry. So ministries are worthy of note and they are worthy of their calling. Other ministries are worthless. Other ministries are profitable. Other ministries add nothing positive. They add nothing to the lives of the church, the lives of the families, and the lives of the members of the church. And the fire will test everything that we do. The fire will test it even now as we go along. And the fire will test at the end of time. The fire 
that reveals the worthy ministry or the worthless ministry. Point number three, the foolishness residing in all worldly wise members. Worldly wise members. Some of the members at Corinth, they dwelt and they rejoiced in Greek philosophy and in Greek wisdom. And the Lord wanted to use Paul the Apostle to enlighten them, to educate them, and to show them the way, open their eyes to the very fact that worldly wisdom in the things of God, worldly wisdom in the ministry, worldly wisdom in our service to the Lord is foolishness in the sight of the Lord. And because it is foolishness, it will not be rewarded by the Lord. The foolishness residing in all worldly wise members. We'll come to point number one now. That's the foundation received by the wise master builder. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation to come into the ministry. We need the grace of God. We need salvation before service. We need sanctification before service. And if we're going to be saved, by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And Paul the Apostle said, I've received the grace of God, number one, to be saved. You're going to serve the Lord. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to edify the church. You're going to be a builder together with God. God is holy. God is righteous and God is upright. A sinner cannot unite with God to build anything in the kingdom of God. A sinner may go to seminary. A sinner may read the Bible through and through. If he has not been saved, if he doesn't have the grace of God, he cannot join together with God, he cannot partner with God and build anything according to the grace of God which is given unto me. The grace comes into somebody's life and makes him born again, saved first according to the grace of God which is given unto me. It is the same grace after we are saved that gets us sanctified. Because God says, I am holy. And he says, be ye holy therefore. If we're going to minister along with God, if we're going to build along with God, if we're going to turn sinners to saints, if we're going to turn the world unto the Lord, if we're going to bring sinners into the kingdom of God and prepare them for eternity, we ourselves must be prepared for eternity. Because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness, no man can serve the Lord. Without holiness, no man can walk together with God. Number one, salvation comes into our lives by the grace of God. Number two, sanctification comes by the grace of God. And then number three, now service in the kingdom of God. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, sage, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, sanctified, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me, brought into the service of God as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. We're looking at three things there. Number one, the master builder's commitment to the foundation of God's temple. The master builder's commitment to the foundation of God's temple. 
when we're talking about God's temple, the word of God makes it very clear. In this same chapter, in verse 16, it tells us in verse 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? You are born again, and the Spirit of God bears witness who are a child of God. You're sanctified and the Spirit of God bears witness that He uproots the damnic nature, He removes the stony heart, and He gives you a heart of flesh. And now you know by that presence of the Spirit, you know by that power of the Spirit, and you know by that enablement of the Spirit, you are a child of God, you become the temple of God. Each individual believer is a temple of God, and then you together as a church will become the temple of God together as the temple of God. It tells us in Second uh, Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Look at that. Ye are the temple of the living God. You as an individual believer, and you as a body, the assembly, the fellowship of the people of God together, ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. Plural. I will dwell in them. He's talking about the connection, the assembly, the fellowship of real children of God as the temple. And then he says, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now the master, the master builder is committed to the foundation of that temple, the temple of God. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16, Isaiah chapter 28, we're well, reading from verse 16. It says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. He's telling us that God himself lays the foundation. And if we're walking along with God, if we're walking together with God, we will not destroy the foundation. We will not displace the foundation. We will not defile the foundation. He lays the foundation. And when he lays the foundation, he wants us now as workers together, as laborers together with God to walk along and to help to solidify and to help to give confidence to people on that foundation. It tells us in First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 6, First Peter chapter 2, we're looking at verse 6, wherefore also, it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He wants us to help sinners to turn away from their sin and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to help those who have turned already those who have believed already to be established on that foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's come to the second part of that now. That's the minister's consent, consecration to the foundation of his holy temple. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 10. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise pastor builder, I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon, another builders thereon. What does that mean? When the foundation has been laid in the church, the church of the living God, somebody lays that foundation. God used Paul the apostle to raise up the church at Corinth. And then after he led, others will have to come. There has to be a pastor in that local church. There has to be teachers in that local church. There will be counselors in that 
that local church. That's what he's talking about. Others build thereupon. And then he says, let every man, whether a prophet or an evangelist, whether a pastor or a teacher, whether a counselor or a helper, anyone that comes to build on that foundation, let every man take heed how he buildeth on that foundation. When you look at our lives as individuals, you are a believer, you are a child of God. Somebody preached the gospel to you, a foundation has been laid. You knew nothing about Jesus Christ. You knew nothing about the Lord. You knew nothing about the Savior. Somebody came and he preached the word of God unto you and the foundation of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ has been laid and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Another now comes to build thereupon that is somebody who is doing follow up, somebody who is counseling you, somebody who is telling you as a child of God, you're a new creature in Christ. This is the way to go, and that is the way to go. He is the one that is building thereupon, and it's saying, Let everyone the counselor, let everyone the one that is doing follow up, let everyone take it what he built the earth thereupon as we belong to the church the polite bible church somebody at the central church laid the foundation and precept upon precept and line upon line and that has been laid as a wise master builder and now when we go to our local church we go to our district church we go to our region churches and we go to our state churches every branch those people who are now preaching after we have laid the foundation, the foundation of that faith once forever, once for all, delivered unto the saints. That foundation has been laid. Let everyone in every local church, everyone in every district church take heed how he buildeth thereon. A child has been brought to the world by the father and the mother. And that child has been taught the word of the Lord. By the effort of the father and the mother, that child has come to know the Lord. The foundation of faith has been laid in the heart, in the life of that child. Now that child goes to school and that child belongs to a uh, this section, maybe children church, and maybe youth, uh, you know, youth section, or maybe campus. Now the people who are teaching those children, the people who are teaching those youth, and the people who are teaching those campus people, they are the people that build thereupon the foundation that have been laid in the hearts of those children. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Members of the church were come together and were taught the word of God and were taught on the sound foundation, a chief cornerstone that should that is complete already. And then we go to the house fellowship. In a house fellowship, all the house fellowship leaders, they're building upon the foundation. And it says, let every house fellowship leader and let everyone that is helping us, let them take heed how they build upon that foundation. You understand? We have the church and then we have the women's section. And the women's section is not in isolation by itself. We have women fellowship, and in those women fellowships, what we're doing is we're building upon the foundation that have been laid already. And Paul the Apostle said, the wise master builder has already laid the foundation, Christ the Savior. Christ the sanctifier and Christ the shepherd and Christ our substitute and Christ the final sacrifice. As we go to the women fellowship, everything we're doing there, we're supposed to build upon the foundation. We're not teaching another thing about Christ. We're not teaching another thing about the family. We're not teaching another thing that makes people to go away from the foundation. That's why Paul the 
apostle said already the foundation is laid and those of us who then support the ministry those of us who preach the word of god and those of us who help people to grow let every man and let every woman let every evangelist let every pastor let every preacher let every teacher take heed how he buildeth thereupon and then he tells us about the holy temple look at verse 17 there in verse 17 he says if any man defile the temple of god him shall god destroy for the temple of god is holy for the temple of God is holy, that the foundation we have laid, that the temple of God is holy, that the foundation that is laid, that God calls every member, every child of God to holiness, and anyone building thereupon should understand anything you build, anything you counsel, anything you teach, anything you, you impart into the lives of the people must still go along with the holiness for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 20, Ephesians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20, it tells us, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. is telling us that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone and then he gave the word to his apostles. He gave the word to the ministers who came to lay up line upon line and precept upon precept. And everything they did was to make us as the body of Christ, as the assembly of, ch of the children of God, to build on the chief cornerstone, who is the foundation. And then he tells us in verse 21 there, it says, in whom all the building are fitly framed together. All the building, is talking now about all the believers as different parts, as different blocks, as different stones, living stones, joined together in such a seamless way that there is no division in such a seamless way that there is no disunity in such a good way there is no disaffection in whom all the building fit and frame together grows into an holy temple in the lord he wants the whole church as we're growing the adults and the youth and the children and the men and the women and the various sections as we're growing to grow together into an holy temple in the Lord. In verse 22, in whom ye also are built together. You see that? In Christ, we're built together. You repent of your sin. You become a saved soul. You come into the kingdom of God. And then in him, as you remain in him, a new creature in Christ, a living stone in Christ, a believer in Christ. And the grace of God has come into your life. And you are now built together an habitation of God. God through the Spirit and habitation of God through the Spirit and he wants us to build upon the foundation of the Word of God everything he commanded everything he taught everything he has given unto us that would take that word without addition without subtraction and would build the lives of the people of God in the habitation of God look at number three here in number three here we're looking at our meaningful comprehension of the foundation of his glorious temple our meaningful comprehension of the foundation of his glorious temple we come to first Corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 11 for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Is saying Jesus Christ is the foundation. 
is appointed by God, is anointed by God, is approved of God. And he says, since heaven has given approval, and since God has given anointing, and since God has said, I lay in Zion a foundation, a, a tried stone, a chief cornerstone, whosoever believes in him will not be confounded. He has laid that foundation, Jesus Christ. What foundation? The foundation of our salvation. He is Savior. There is no other Savior. Don't uh, introduce another personality, another entity to be our Savior. He is our Savior, and the people who have come on that foundation, they are saved. And they have the life of somebody who is saved and truly born again. Jesus Christ is the foundation. What does that mean? It's our sanctifier. And because it's a sanctifier, all that come to him must understand that if they're going to be on that foundation, abide in that foundation, there is a sanctification experience. It makes them holy saints in the sight of the Lord. It's telling us Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the sacrifice, the final sacrifice. There's no other sacrifice. If anybody comes and introduces another animal sacrifice, and then he might refer to the Old Testament, all that is gone. Christ is the foundation. Is now the foundation of the gospel, and he is the final sacrifice. No other sacrifice that is necessary. He's talking about Jesus Christ at the foundation. He is the shepherd. And he says, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. If we're laying the foundation, and we're reassuring the believers that Christ is the foundation, we're making them to understand he is the shepherd, and all the people who are built on that foundation, and the foundation is established in them, they are a sheep. And they are not sheep that are scattered. They are sheep that are following after the shepherd. He's saying that Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the Lord and the King. And because he's Lord and King, if we're really building on that foundation, all the people that have come into the kingdom, all the people that make that holy temple, they are following after him with absolute surrender. Absolute surrender. Because they recognize him as the foundation, as the Lord, and as the King. Jesus Christ is the foundation and he is the mediator. He is our advocate. There's no other person to stand between us and the Almighty God. An angel cannot stand between us and the Almighty God. Any man, whatever his status, cannot stand between us and the Almighty God because he is the mediator and he is the advocate. That's the foundation and we're making everybody to look unto Christ, the Christ who is the author and the finisher of our faith. You understand, it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Jesus, the foundation, is the Word, is the final Word is the authoritative word and he is the word that makes us to live and please god there's no addition to that word he is the foundation is complete there's no subtraction from that word he is the foundation and he is complete that's why paul the apostle emphasized by the spirit of god and he says for all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know, as Paul the Apostle was talking to those Corinthians, you might wonder, can anybody try endeavor to add 
or to shield or to break another foundation. And look at uh, Second Corinthians, reading from chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 3 here. Second Corinthians chapter 11, we're reading from verse 3. For I, but I fear, is he writing to these Corinthians? I fear lest by any means at the serpent be gouge Eve through the subtil through a subtlety so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ you see they were being suffocated by the wisdom of the Greeks by the uh, by the wisdom of the Jewish people and he said I'm afraid of you lest your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ look at verse 4 in verse 4 it says it says for if he that cometh preaches another Jesus he that cometh after we have laid the foundation after Paul the Apostle has laid the foundation of Christ as Savior Christ as sanctifier Christ as shepherd and Christ as the final sacrifice Christ as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and Christ as the mediator and the advocate and Christ as the word the final word the living word after that if he that cometh somebody who is coming Coming as a helper, somebody who is coming as a supporter, somebody who is coming as a counselor, somebody who is coming as a pastor teacher. If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul the Apostle was concerned that there will be people that will try to come and preach another Christ, another Savior. Grace is not enough. Faith is not enough. And the Spirit of God is not enough. They must bring another human element that changes the gospel and that defiles and destroys the gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, we're looking at verse 7. In Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 7, which is not another. There's no other gospel and there's no other foundation. Anybody that comes and talks about another Christ, another Savior, another shepherd, another sanctifier, another shepherd, and talks about another king, another Lord, another mediator, another advocate, another what there is not another, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert pervert the gospel of Christ and would pervert the gospel of Christ. In verse 8, now Paul the apostle says, but though we are an angel from heaven, those of us who have laid the foundation and Paul the apostle said, by the grace of God as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation was talking about uh, Apollos. He has watered as well. Was talking about Peter, Stephen, uh, uh, Stephen. He has also helped. Though we, Paul, Apollos, or Peter, or any other person, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye, which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. He was so very sure about the foundation he has laid. He was so very sure about the authenticity, about the spirituality, about the infallibility of the word that he said, if anybody, even an angel from heaven, if he preaches any other gospel to you than that what you have got already about salvation, about sanctification, about holiness, about the power of the Holy Ghost, and about the things to come, about the future. If any other person brings any other gospel than what you have learned already, let him be a curse. In verse 9, in verse 9, it says, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that 
ye have received, let him be a cause. We need to comprehend the gospel, comprehend the foundation, stand by the foundation, abide by the foundation, and then whatever we're building on to build according to the pattern revealed unto us in the word of God. Now we come to point number two. In point number two, the fire to reveal the worthy ministry of the worthless ministry. We're coming to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 12. Now, if any man built upon this foundation, if any evangelist, if any pastor, if any preacher, if any teacher, if any counselor, if any supporter, if any helper, if any man built upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious tools, wood, his trouble, verse 13, it says in verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest. Every evangelist's work shall be made manifest. Every writer's work shall be made manifest. Every tele-evangelist's work shall be made manifest. Every preacher on the YouTube shall be made manifest. Every author of every gospel book, so to say, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. It shall be revealed by fire. The day of judgment, every man's work shall be revealed by fire. The day of reckoning, every man's work shall be, shall be revealed by fire. The day of testing and the day of evaluating, evaluating the work you're doing, evaluating the work I'm doing, every man's work shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. In verse 14, it says in verse 14, if any man's work shall abide, that which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And then in verse 15, it says, if any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. And then in verse 16, he tells us, know ye not, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Then verse 17 says, in verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the reward of a Bible-based worthy ministry. We're coming to First Corinthians uh, chapter chapter three, reading from verse twelve all through to verse fourteen. In First Corinthians chapter three, verse twelve. Now, if any man builds upon this foundation, gold that's precious, and silver that's precious and then precious tools they would his trouble in verse 13 it says every man's work shall be made manifest for the day of reckoning the day of judgment the day of evaluation shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try the fire shall test every man's work of what sort it is then in verse 14 it says if any man's work shall abide because it's built of gold it's built of silver is built of precious stone if any man's work abide if any teacher's work abide if any pastor's work abide if any supporters work abide if any woman's work abide if any leader's work abide which he has built thereupon he shall receive 
a reward. He shall receive a reward. There is a reckoning day. There is a day when God is going to look at everything we have done in the kingdom, everything we have emphasized in the kingdom, everything we have preached to the people that were, that were leading in the way of the Lord. A reckoning day is coming. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We apostles, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ with the prophets and with the evangelists. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ with pastors and with teachers of the word. We must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We lead us in the church and support us in the ministry. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every man every man every preacher every pastor every leader every worker that every man may receive the things done in his body everything we've done in the days of opportunity everything we've done in the days of ministry that everyone will receive what he has done in the body and then it says whether it be good or whether it be bad whether it be worthy or worthless whether it be useful or useless we shall receive for what we have done a reckoning day is coming in ecclesiastes chapter 12 ecclesiastes chapter 12 we're reading from verse 13 ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear god and keep his commandments fear god and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man are you a preacher fear god and keep his commandments are you a disciple of christ fear god and keep his commandments are you a pastor are you a preacher the lord has sent forth the holy spirit has sent forth separate unto me barnabas and so for the work whereunto i've appointed them you understand you must keep the commandment of the lord and fear god while you are ministering are you supporting in any way your soul winner your house fellowship leader your worker your member of the body of Christ, a member of the church, and you're giving the bread of life and the water of life to other people, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Why? In verse 14, in verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment. For God shall bring every action into judgment. For God shall bring every contribution into judgment. For God shall bring every part, everything we have done, he'll bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I pray our work will not be evil. Your work will not be worthless. Your work will be worthy of reward on that final day in Jesus' name. Let's come to number two here. The regrets after a burnt, worthless ministry. What if somebody, you know, is laboring and laboring and is expending energy, is expending all his uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual attributes and is expending money, everything he has is spending is, and is paid, is sweating uh, on the work and then uh, is building only wood, hay and stubble that fire will consume very easily let's come back to first corinthians chapter 3 reading from verse 12 first corinthians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 12 now if any man builds upon this foundation the foundation that has been laid it doesn't destroy the foundation it doesn't tamper with the foundation it doesn't replace the foundation it still says he believes in the lord jesus christ and the foundation is still intact but now he builds gold silver precious stones wood 
He stubborn. Then in verse 13, it says, Every man's work, if it is wood, if it is hay, if it is stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Then in verse 15, in verse 15, it says, If any man's work which is, shall be burnt because it's wood combustible and because it's hay and because it's stubble if any man's work shall be burnt any counselor's work shall be burnt if any advisor's work shall be shall be burnt there are people they counsel others on marriage and they leave the foundation and they sympathize with the people because of what you are going through because of your suffering I identify with you. Who can say you should stay with such a man? Leave the man. If I were you, I would leave such a man. Is that according to the foundation of one man, one wife, until death do us part? If we advise people, if we counsel people according to our own misconceived idea, well, you don't have any job, and the only job you've got now, they say you will sell alcohol, they say you will sell tobacco, they say you will sell things that will poison the lives of people. Really, I want to tell you, we shouldn't do something like that, but in your condition, in your situation, who will tell you not to go and do that? It says, if any man's work shall be burnt. You counsel people in their own way. You advise people to go in their own direction. You bring in human ideology and human wisdom, and then you tell people, well, um, if I were you, I think I will consider this. And what you are telling them to consider is contrary to the word of God. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He's telling us there the danger of teaching people that misleads them away from the kingdom of God. In Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 3, we're reading from verse 1. And unto the ancient of the church in Sardis right. This thing says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. I know thy works in the plural. He was still a leader. He has not been removed from being a leader. He was still the regular preacher, pastor of that church in Sardis. And yet Jesus said, I know your works, that you have a name, that you live, you are active, you are here and there, but you are dead. Because he was not contributing, he was not preaching, he was not leading the people to more life. If they got life before he got there, it's not leading them to abundant life, to spiritual life, to a holy life, and to a heavenly minded life. It's not leading them to grow in the things of life. But thou art dead. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that, that are ready to die for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Wasn't it good that while the man was still alive he had been building wood, his trouble and the Lord came to confront him when he could still make correction. The Lord came to correct him when he could still turn around and do that which is right. He said, I have not found thy works perfect before God. As a house fellowship leader, as Christ found your work perfect before God, as a woman leader, leading women in your district, in your group, as God found your work perfect before the Lord, or you're not even doing anything 
at all. You are just there. You have a name that you're a woman leader, and yet you are not contributing anything to the progress of the lives of the people spiritually. Or maybe you're a group pastor, and uh, you never stay on any, on any district, and you never preach anything. You might go around and go around. You're active, but the word, you're not giving out the word. You cannot point to people that got saved as a result of your ministration, as people that got sanctified, as people that got a real biblical scriptural conviction as a result of your ministry. Or maybe you're an overseer. As an overseer, you just take your time. Anytime you want to get to the church, the local church, after all, all the coordinators are there to preach, all the group pastors are there, all the other helpers and preachers are there, and you are not up and doing. There is no program, there is nothing to move the people forward, and the Lord is saying, you have a name that you live, a name, a title, but then I've not found your works perfect before God. The fire will taste and the judgment of God will test, and the penetrating judgment of God will test on that day of reckoning. Where will you stand at that time? Will you just be a person that have been there and yet nothing positive is contributed into the lives of the people we're leading? Go look at number three here. It says in number three, it talks about now what we ought to do, the reason for a bold, worthwhile ministry. We're coming back to First Corinthians uh, chapter three, and I'm reading from verse 16. First Corinthians chapter three, and we're reading here from verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Don't you know that the church of God is the temple of God? Don't you know that everyone that is born again, that little child born again, that youth born again, and that campus person born again, that sister, that lady born again, that mother born again, don't you know that father born again, that member of the church is born again, don't you know that he or she is the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you, dwelleth in a child of God. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Look at that word, underline that word in your Bible, defile, defile. If any man defile the temple of God. You see that word defile, the Corinthians might not have understood because some of them are from Jewish background and some of them also from Gentile background. And there are many people today, uh, they're just walking and walking and walking and they do not understand if any man, and God is no respecter of persons. God is not a partial God. If any man, call him an apostle. If any man, call him a pastor. If any man, call him by whatever title and overseer. If any man, call her a counselor. Call her an advisor. Call her a mother in Israel. Call her by any title. If anyone defile the temple of God, him, her, shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye am. Now, what did, what standard is God going to use? Is Christ going to use on the day of reckoning on that word defile? Come to Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Mark chapter 7, verse 21. In the case of the, of the Jewish people, they think that if you are going to eat, if you don't wash your hands, you are defiled. If you don't wash the cup, you are defiled. If you don't wash the containers of whatever, you are defiled. But Jesus said, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, 
murders, verse 22, in verse 22, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile the man, and defile the man. If, as a minister, your actions, your counseling, your answers to questions will make people to go towards those things that defile according to the doctrine of Christ. Then if anyone defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. In Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Let's look at this. Any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. When the word of God says, if any man defiles the temple of God, it's not just talking about the sins of the flesh. It's talking about bitterness. You know, you can poison people's mind against constituted authority. Authority in the world, that's government, authority at home, fathers and mothers. You can poison the minds of children against their parents, father and mother. Authority in the church, the leadership of the church, you can poison people's minds. And you can sow the seed of bitterness and the root of bitterness. And it says the root of bitterness springing up will defile many. And if anyone will defile the church of God by planting seed of bitterness and the root of bitterness in the hearts of people in the church, him shall God destroy. This is not a person now that will be saved so as by fire the people that do not have anything against uh, the foundation and they build on the foundation. Only what they were building did not make people to grow, did not add positively to their lives. They'll be saved so as by fire. There'll be no reward for them. But the people that defile the children of God and the church of God, the people that sow be bitterness in the hands of people, him shall God destroy. In Revelation chapter 21, we're reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, we're reading here from verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. And then in verse 27, in verse 27, it tells us there, in verse 27, looking at all that defiles the people, it says, and there shall in no wise enter into it any sin that defileth. All those things we read about in verse 8, they are the things that defile, and it says, there shall in no wise enter into heaven anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are rich in in the Lamb's book of life. That's why we're called to boldness in ministry. You're a pastor, you need to be bold in the ministry so that you preserve the church of God, you preserve the temple of God, you preserve every individual member in the church of the living God, you preserve them from defilement. And we need to pray that God will give us such boldness and such authority that we declare the word of God without fear and without favor. He tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, 1 John 
chapter 4, reading from verse 17, about the character and about the mindset of a person who is going to build on the foundation gold and, and silver and precious stone, who is going to help and who is going to develop, who is going to move forward the temple of the living God, who is going to keep holy and keep righteous the temple of the living God. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this present world. As he is, as Christ would have been, if we were here now, he'll declare his word, he'll declare the word of the Father with boldness, without fear, without favor. He'll want to bring everyone that comes to him, bring them into the righteousness of God, into the holy nature of God as he is. So are we in this present world. We'll come to point number three now. Point number three is the foolishness residing in all worldly wise members. We're coming to First Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 18. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Let no man deceive you. Let no man, because of his office, deceive you. Let no man, because of his popularity, deceive you. Let no man because of his ability to communicate, even when he's communicating error, let no man deceive you. Let no man because of his bold face, very aggressive and can do whatever, let no man deceive you. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Let him accept that without the wisdom of God, without the word of God is nothing and he has nothing. Let him become a fool that he may be wise. In verse 19, in verse 19 it says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom people acquire in the world of literature, in the world of politics, in the world of management, in the world of this and that, all that wisdom, we cannot bring that into the church and lead the church with the wisdom of the world without the Spirit of God. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their craftiness. And then in verse 20, in verse 20, it tells us that again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Verse 21, verse 21 then says, Therefore, let no man glory in men, whether Paul or Apollos or Savers or Titus or Timothy or any other man, an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all all things are yours. And then in verse 22, it tells us whether Paul or Apollos or Sivas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And then in verse 23, it says, and ye are Christ's and Christ is God and Christ is God's. Look at three things here. Number one, the foolishness of the worldly wise critics. The foolishness of the worldly wise critics. That's why he says in chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, how foolish the people of the world, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom they acquire by the proverbs of the world, principles of the world, pattern of the world, and the wisdom they acquire in the literature of the world. Let no man deceive himself. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Then verse 19, in verse 19 it says, for the wisdom of this world is full 
foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. He wants us to have the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the people of the world. That's why he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Galatians chapter 6, reading from verse 3, it says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he doesn't have assurance of salvation, is nothing. He doesn't have the Spirit of God guiding, controlling, influencing him, is nothing. He doesn't have the, the, the alerting of the Holy Spirit that is guiding him and it is checking him. Don't go that way, don't do that thing. He doesn't have the checks of the Spirit of God in his life, he is nothing. He doesn't have Christ living big in his life and he doesn't have the Almighty God speaking to to him every time this is the way to go and this is not the way to go and yet he thinks himself to be something if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing he deceives himself I pray you'll not deceive yourself I said I pray you'll not deceive yourself Let's look at number two here. Number two here is talking about the fruitlessness of worldly, witty contenders. The contenders who contend against the word of God. The critics who contend against the word of God. The argumentators, the debaters who contend against the word of God. Their lives are fruitless. Whatever they say, whatever they do, they cannot get souls convicted of their sin and they cannot get souls driven to their knees to pray for salvation and they cannot bring transformation in the lives of people and make them to decide and make them to consecrate and make them to go the way of the Lord and live a better life and live a transformed life but they criticize sound doctrine they criticize the word of God and yet what they want to bring in replacement to that does not transform transform any life the fruitlessness of the worldly witty contender it tells us in first corinthians chapter 3 and verse 20 first corinthians chapter 3 verse 20 and again the lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain the lord knows the thoughts of the worldly wise that they are vain they are wise beyond scripture they're wise beyond revelation. They're wise beyond Christ. They're wise beyond the doctrines of the Bible. They're wise beyond the revelation of the word of God that leads us into intimate, close fellowship with God. All the thoughts of those worldly, worldly wise people, they are vain. It tells us in chapter 2, verse 6. First Corinthians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 6. It tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 6, albeit we speak wisdom among them which are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. The wisdom of the people of this world that come to naught. They cannot lead to salvation that come to naught. They cannot lead us to sanctification that come to naught. They cannot lead us to surrender, absolute surrender unto God that come to naught. The wisdom of this world cannot make us to have more of the grace of God and to live the victorious life those things come to naught. I pray that your life will not be based on nothingness in Jesus' name. Did I hear your amen? amen. Number three is the fullness 
the fullness of the wise by the word Christians. The Christians who are made wise by the word. They look at the word of God and on the basis of the word of God, that's how they become wise. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 21, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. All things are yours. All things provided at Calvary. All things are yours. All things provided by Christ. All things are yours. All things promised by the Lord. All things are yours. All things provision in the kingdom of God. All things are yours. All things that depend on faith. All things are yours. All things that we go on our knees and we get from the Lord by prayer. All things are yours. It says in verse 22, it says, Whether, whether Paul or Apollos or Sabers or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Look at eight things there. Number one, all things are yours, Paul. Number one, all things are yours, Apollos. Number two, all things are yours, Sivas. Number three, all things are yours. Number four, with the world, all things are yours. Number five, life, all things are yours. Number six, death, all things are yours, things present. Number eight, all things are yours, all things are yours. What's he talking about when he says, all things are yours and then he mentions Paul is talking about Paul's revelation all the revelation that God gave to Paul the Apostle he says everything is yours it was given to Paul not to hurt and not to only hold to himself it was given to him so that he can reveal unto you Paul's revelation yours and Apollo's re-fortification it is Apollo's and when he comes he gets the people to be strengthened in the way of the Lord he re-fortifies them and he says all things things belonging to Apollos to re-fortify you. All things are yours. And it says recollection, the resources of Peter. He was with the Lord Jesus Christ and all the recollection of Peter and all the resources of Peter, everything is made available unto you. Why would you live like an orphan? Why would you live for somebody that does not have revelation, re-fortification or resources or recollection? In fact, it says even the world's reconciliation that the Lord Jesus Christ has given himself that the world will be reconciled unto him and the world's reconciliation that belongs to you too. You've been in the world, you can be reconciled unto God. And then he tells us even the things belonging unto life the refreshment of life, life's refreshing, all the promises that God has given to refresh your life, to renew your life, to recreate your life, all things are yours. And he says, even the restraints of death, the restraints of death also that be belongs to you. When you remember that death is coming and that restrains you, and you know it may come today, it may come to tomorrow, and even Death is serving you as a restraint, the restraints of death and the things present, present responsibilities, all things are yours and the future, the realization of the future, it says all things are yours and then it says everything, when you sum up everything together, the redemption in Christ, all things are yours, the righteousness of Christ, all things are yours and the riches of Christ, all things things are yours and ye are Christ and Christ is God's. The Lord has revealed to us today that we need to come back to the very foundation, the foundation of Christ our Savior, foundation of Christ our sanctifier, foundation of Christ our shepherd, foundation of Christ the final sacrifice, foundation of Christ the Lord and the King, foundation of Christ the mediator and the advocate, foundation of Christ the word
watch the living word and the final word and it says if you have been built on this foundation keep on building keep on building and you're going to build in the lives of other people let it remain on that foundation grow as you are established in that foundation of the Lord I pray that the grace the same grace God gave to Paul the Apostle and the same strength and the same faith God gave to those worthies of old the Lord will impart into your life all right the Lord will impart into my life all things will be yours in Jesus name amen so weak amen that will be more grace into your life let us rise up now let us rise up now and receive more of the grace of God and more of the faith in the living word and more of everything we ought to have as we build on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray so that something greater, something higher will be added into your life, your Christian life, and your Christian ministry today.